Okay, so watch how clever this righteousness thing is. So you can see at once the war of it in your daily life on a psychological level. That's what we're going to focus on here. And how God's goals are all accomplished even with failure. All at the same time. And bear in mind that the, the whole idea is to have oneness with Him, which means a oneness of perspective, not necessarily performance, which of course is never going to be met. But it's really not the objective that it be met. What's the objective? What Christ prayed for in John 17 was oneness. He didn't pray for performance. He didn't pray that we all be sinless and get rid of our sins and be goody tissues. I don't know why pastors don't like focus on that. What did he pray for? That they may be in you, that they may be in me the way I am in you. Oneness. Not be perfect, not be good, not get rid of sin, not for a better world. Okay, well, what is oneness? Share viewpoint. You know, like an old married couple. They've been married so long, you don't, the, 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 the two don't even know where one stops and the other begins. They still have their flaws. An old married couple, one will start to talk and the other will finish the sentence or already knows what's going to be said, not because of the repetition, but because the other person in the couple is so familiar with his spouse or her spouse that it's as if they're one person. See, that was the end of Genesis 2. They join together and they become what? One person. Same thing as Christ prayed for in John 17. Not only for the disciples, but for those who hear their word. What is their word? Well, how about the New Testament? And it's not just the New Testament because the New Testament is constantly quoting the old. So it's really the whole Bible. So when that word gets in you, you can finish God's sentences. You know how he thinks, you see through his eyes. Doesn't mean you're perfect, doesn't mean you stop sinning, doesn't mean you become good. But you see through his eyes. That's the objective now, okay? So now, let's look at this thing. God wants truth be free. You've heard me say that. God wants full spectrum truth. God wants to join the high to the low at every dot in the spectrum. That's why hell has to exist forever. God's in that too. He's been in it since eternity past before anybody was even there. It's all one big now. A billion years ago, a billion years from now. A bazillion years ago, a bazillion years from now. It's all one big now to him. So there's never a time when he doesn't experience hell himself, even before anybody's ever there. And he experiences it at God level, which means the whole enchilada, whereas any of us, we're just experiencing sort of like little dots of reality and that very dimly. You're getting this. So how are you going to be one with a person who's like that? Well, obviously your oneness in him is kind of limited to the scope of what you are. So the idea is for you to become a bigger person. Not better, bigger. So all of you is to be in him. They may be in him, may and be, be in me. He's in us, but are we in him? 
Well, how can you be in somebody else unless you share their thinking? Again, like the old married couple. You know, an old married couple, they even look like each other after a long enough time being married. I don't know if you've noticed that. It's not just because they're old. The mannerisms become the same. The thought patterns are so similar, it's really hard to tell. The personality difference between the couple. And they're real comfortable with each other, too. Well, that's what we're talking about here. So look how God does this. First of all, the objective is for all of you to be in him the way he's in you. Now, it isn't the same scope, but it would end up being all of you at his level. Experienced on a limited basis in your case, in my case, because we're limited beings. But it would be total as far as, you know, our own nature is concerned. Doesn't mean we can obey, doesn't mean we can do anything with it. Just be. So now think of a house. You got a front door. And in most houses, you got a back door. The back door usually goes to the backyard. Or it goes to an alley. There's almost always a back door to a house. Sometimes the back door is a garage door. But you get the point. You got the front door, which is usually for company and strangers. And the back door is usually for your friends. At least that's the way it was in California in the 1950s when Bewitched, Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best. If you've seen any of those sitcoms, you know what I'm talking about when I say front door, back door. And life was really like that. I lived that life. California, 1950s, 1960s, and not only California, but a whole lot of other places. But those sitcoms actually took place in California, and those were California, usually track homes. And a whole lot of people lived like that, and I was one of them. So the back door was where your neighbor came in to borrow the cup of sugar or to bring you a pan of brownies she just made. And even if the brownies were bad, you smiled and said thank you. In those days, the little girls, and I was one of them, we had our little tea parties with our dolls. I hated dolls. I used to take off their heads to figure out how the doll worked. And you had to wear little gloves, and you had to have little teapots, and you had little tea parties with your other girlfriends, all of you about five or six or seven, and you wore pinafore dresses that were starched by your mother within an inch of their life, and they itched, and you wore petticoats and shiny patent leather shoes with socks that you cuffed. They were white. You've seen these pictures in the sitcoms. Okay, people really live like that. And you had a hutch with sample plates, usually delft. And you had them on little, little sort of like, you know, uh, what do you want to call them? Uh, some kind of um, tripod that the plate sat on because you were showing off the plates rather than eating from them. Why people did that, I don't know, but it was a very common habit. You get all this picture. Okay. That was for company. You had a living room for company. They came through the front door. You took their coat and you put it in a special coat closet. And you ushered them into the living room and you had your tea. And when you were a little girl, you had tea parties so you could learn to show tea as an adult. Tea and coffee in the living room. And no, the kids were never allowed in the living room. That was always for company who came through the front door. In other words, it was all fancy and high at the front door. That was where you put on your best face. That was like the sort of royal treatment, as close as middle America could come to royalty. That's what everybody did in order to show respect to a guest, especially a stranger. 
But your friends and the people you were close to, they all came through the back door. So as not to muddy up the front door, not to muddy up the living room, and not to muddy up the foyer. And you sat at the, at the kitchen table. It was always a big kitchen with a lot of windows. And you always sat at the kitchen table and you had your cup of coffee in the morning. And the wives would talk about their husband's work and what the, you know, the wives' own kids and what Johnny did today. And there was usually a dog, you know, a dog bed off in the corner by the back door. When there was a doggy door, the dog went out. You're getting this picture, I'm hoping. This was the way America, especially in Western America and especially in California, worked. 1950s, 1960s, and even to some extent, early 1970s. So the back door was kind of, was low and intimate. The front door were strangers and high. High face. In other words, you put on your best face, your best clothes, your best behavior, Everything was front door and the front of the house. Back of the house was where you could get dirty and, you know, intimate with everybody. And it was only the, you know, your friends. Okay. In God's house. God, of course, is at the front of the house. In our minds. He's the big guy up in the sky, aloof and glorious and glamorous with the lightning flashes and the jasmine and the the jasper and the carnelian and all the jewels that are depicted for the new Jerusalem coming down out of the clouds. That's kind of how we picture God. Sort of Oz brain behind a machine that if he talks we quake. We don't think about him in intimate terms. We think about him as the one who is either sugar daddy or petty judge and he, he meets out justice and you say yes sir and no sir and you're always wearing your petticoat and your gloves and your patent leather shoes and the boy's always you know combed and freshly bathed wearing his little suit and the girl's wearing her little pinafore. That's the God idea we got. You only see him on formal occasions like Easter and Christmas. Now he is that high. Okay, but the relationship that he wants is through the back door. Low and intimate. We don't think about it that way. We don't think of God that way. In fact, we even feel as though we're being arrogant if we try to think about him that way. Okay, but Christ prayed for it to be that way, John 17. The other thing about that front door is that we think we're supposed to put on our best face to God and our best behavior and all that stuff, and that's the way it's supposed to be. And then we look at that high front door place of God and we think we're honoring him that way. And we look at the distance. And we feel real intimidated. We don't measure up. And we feel pretty righteous about the fact that we feel intimidated and low and don't measure up. And we think that's the way it's supposed to be. And you can argue, well, yeah, it is. It's that way whether it's supposed to be or not. He's high, we're low. We can't measure up. And then we start saying, well, I should obey. 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 And it's this agonizing thing that's always in our head. He's high, I'm low, I should obey. Okay, but if he's high and you're low, then you can't obey. Even when you try. Even if by human standards you succeed, it's never by God's standards you succeed. So that's always depressing. Eventually, unless you hallucinate what a good person you are, because you put a dollar in the collection plate. So then what you're aware of is this huge difference between him and you. And how can that be righteous? 
And then Satan's busy arguing, well, how can it be righteous for God to create us so low? There's this great gulf fixed, and how can we have a happy relationship with God when that great gulf is there? And just like what God did to Adam, he wants to do to us. What did he do to Adam? Adam was down here created to be the witness in the trial against Satan. We'll learn all that in Genesis 1 and 2. But God didn't create Adam and the human race the way he did all the angels at once. It was just Adam. And a whole bunch of what? Animals. And what was Adam to do? Name the animals. Well, that's taxonomy, so he wasn't stupid. Certainly not a caveman. Definitely not a mediator or a hunter-gatherer. He ate from the trees, walked around God knows how far. You know, the park seems to be depicted between the Nile and the Euphrates River and everything in between. Which is that whole, you know, land bridge, geographically. Okay, so if he's busy naming the animals and ruling the animals... It means he's classifying them, he's taking care of them as much as they needed to be taken care of. It means they were all tame. What are the animals compared to him? Well, they're inferior, aren't they? So God takes a backdoor approach, even though he's a front door worthy person. And so he gives Adam something to be front door about with all the animals lower than him so that Adam will learn to want to go the back door too. Thus Adam learns the enjoyment of intimacy even though he's superior to the animals. You're superior to your dog. I bet you don't think about yourself that way. I bet what you think about is the needs of the dog and how cute the dog is and what you can teach the dog. And when the dog does something wrong, you want to teach him so that he cannot do that thing wrong. And I bet you're real careful about how you teach him because you want him to learn a lesson. You don't want to beat up the dog. Why? Because you care about the dog. Does it matter that the dog is inferior to you? No. Does it matter that your kids are inferior to you? No. You don't even think about it that way. What you think about are their own needs. And you want to have a close and intimate relationship with them. You don't say to the dog, your kids, well, you're lower than me. You're not worth my attention. Go away. Or you should just obey me and slave for me. You don't think that way about them and you don't treat them that way. So by having stuff inferior to us, we learn that backdoor intimacy. And we learn why God wants it with us. By means of an analogous relationship we have to those things and people and animals who are inferior to us. And somebody and something somewhere, no matter how low you are, is inferior to you. No matter how bad you are, on any given day, there's always somebody inferior to you. In fact, there are probably going to be a whole lot of people inferior to you. Everybody's inferior to everybody else in something. And as a general matter, you know... A whole lot of people are inferior to a whole lot of other people in something. Okay? Now, some people in this life think it's real important to be superior to others. 
It, it, they need it. They need that sense of superiority to buttress their ego, but it's really an offshoot of a desire to have a worthwhile life. Because we all feel so insecure. I'm so limited. Everything about us is dependent on something. Actually, a whole lot of somethings. So we automatically have a backdoor relationship. To everything else in life but we're supposed to act as if it's a front door relationship that's how we think what it's supposed to be God saying no it's a whole house front door back door so sometimes we're having a back door relationship with God but he wants to show us the front door and sometimes we keep thinking oh it's front door front door front door but it's really back door that he wants so sometimes he gives you too much prosperity by your own standards or too much adversity by your own standards because you're going toward one door or the other and he needs to show you the other side of the relationship. And we are actually entering into him through the back door. We get to see what inferiority is, which he already knows, through the back door, the low end. The intimate end. We're intimate with what's low and weak and stupid. And he wants to show that he wants the whole house. Not just the front door. Not to be a stranger in your life that you see on Easter and Christmas. And you put on your best clothes and your best face. And you sit real stiff and you can't you never really hear anything that the pastor talks about because it's the nod to God thing on Sunday or Easter or Christmas or when it's expected rather than the fact you want to go because you just want to hear more about God. You know, when you're friendly with somebody, when you're intimate with somebody, you want to talk to them all the time about anything. It's not a formal relationship. You don't sit stiff in the parlor with your uncomfortable tie and your uncomfortable suit try not to bend over to get the tea that's already going cold because you're afraid to drink it because you might spill it and that's why a lot of people live front door relationships in life because it's all about appearance to them not about substance but God wants the sweatshirt life the jeans, laying on the carpet where there's too much dog hair. And he wants the front door too. That was all in the design of all those like Levitical offerings and all the ceremonies in the Old Testament. He was constantly marrying the mundane daily stuff with the high and mighty. That's why they had the rituals that they had. It was an ironic... When you Go look at the Mosaic Law very closely. Look at all the individual motions and parts to it. And you'll notice he's constantly marrying a high ideal and a sort of very, what do you want to call it, formal function with something very mundane. I mean, for crying out loud, circumcision? That's about as intimate as it gets. You can't call that a uh, noble. Every time you pee. So he wants a front door and a back door. So they can unite all the points in between. And that sounds real good to talk about it. But to actually live like that is hard. To love all the spectrum the way he loves it, that's hard. But that's him. Front door and back door. And therefore through the back door we come to see why he isn't interested 
and restricting the relationship to the front door. Ecumenical religion never will learn that. They'll chirp about God is love and God's in every part of your life, but then they go on with their motions and their ceremonies <clears throat> and their rituals, and that totally blanks out the intimate character of God and turns it into an emotional exercise. So you see your emotion instead of him. The flip side are all the tongues crowd and the healing crowd and the emotional crowd and the jump up and down and sing rah-rah for Jesus crowd. They don't know him either and they never will. They're trying to get the intimacy. They're trying to get the back door. But they divorce the word from it, even though they mouth it, they have no idea what it is. By being low, we learn God through the bottom going up to the top. And then we learn why God went down to the bottom, to be intimate with it. So it's neither the rituals, well, there's a place for that at times, and it isn't the rah-rah Jesus stuff either, although there's a place for it at times. So the genius of this righteousness full-spectrum love that God has is that you get a full-spectrum understanding of him. And you get a full spectrum relationship with him. So that like the old married couple at the end of your life, you don't know where he ends and you begin. That's what Christ means by oneness in John 17. And that's why this whole trip that he takes us on to learn to love righteousness, which we're motivated to do because of him, 2 Corinthians 5.14, he wants us to love it for itself too. So we're not loving the righteousness because of him. We start out that way, but he wants it to be independent. And then we're really seeing it through his eyes independently. Because that's the promise of 1 John 2.26-3.2. We'll see him just as he is because we'll be just like him. In other words, at no point in this high, low, front door, back door relationship do you lose your free will. Does the love for Christ, that's second, uh, flip, uh, Ephesians 3, 15 through 19, at no event does it like deprive you of your freedom. It increases it instead. He doesn't even want you to be dependent on him. He sustains you, and by nature you are dependent on him, just as I am and everybody else. But what he wants to do with that is to create independence out of it. So that when you love what he loves the way he loves it, it's because you really see it too. Now that all sounds kind of impossible, huh? Yep. But like Christ said, nothing's impossible for God. So that's why this little trip about the oneness and the righteousness and loving righteousness and front door and back door, full spectrum, united at every point intimacy, is the meaning of the spiritual life. And it's beyond human. And it hurts all the time. And it's beyond happiness, contentment all the time. And everything in between. Because that's how we design reality to be. Front door and back door. Just because. <laughs>